Peace be to you. The two words most often used and abused in our modern world are the words freedom and sex. Freedom is often used to signify the absence of law, and sex is often used to signify the absence of restraint. It is this subject that we are interested in today in the general discussion of matrimony. We will commence with three very popular expressions about the subject of sex, and then apply some thinking to these expressions. The first popular expression is, sex is not anything to be ashamed of. Now that can be understood in a right and wrong sense. It is right if it means that the human race reproduces itself in a certain way that gives pleasure. But that expression can be wrong if it means carnal license, the mess that sex instinct has got us in today, uncontrolled use of pornographic literature, if these things are nothing to be ashamed of, then the expression is wrong. Let us take a second one. We must be self-expressive. That is right if it means that we are to perfect our personality. It is wrong, however, if self-expression means to allow the sex instinct every satisfaction and at all times and under all circumstances. Uh, we must analyze the full significance of the term self-expression. A locomotive on a track following the road that was laid out by an engineer, is self-expressive if it stays on the tracks. Then it reaches its full perfection as a locomotive. If, however, the locomotive says to itself, why should I obey the laws and the track that were, tracks that were laid down for me by an engineer some years ago? I'm going to follow my own impulses. If it jumps the track, it was self-expressive in the wrong sense of the term, and then it destroyed itself. Can you imagine a soldier in battle deserting the line, and then running back to safety, meeting a superior officer? And can you imagine that superior officer saying to him, I am so glad that you were self-expressive. After all, we have inherited a number of old Victorian ideas that a man should stay in the battlefield and fight for his cause and for his country. But you have allowed your personality to manifest itself. You have deserted the lines. and You have come back here to safety. I commend you. We shall give you a medal for being self-expressive. Makes a lot of nonsense, does it not? Certainly we are to follow the idiom, be yourself, but we have to remember what we are. We are human beings. We are not animals. And a third expression that is often used today is, well, God would never have given us this particular instinct unless he intended it to be used. Therefore, we have a right to use it. Certainly. But we have a right to use it according to our nature. Now, what is the nature of man? Is it that of a rational animal? Or is it the nature of a rooster? Inasmuch as our nature is rational, that is to say we have to live according to purposes and goals, well then it follows that we are to use our instincts according to that order of reason and not according to mere instinct. 
We have a hunting instinct, but we are not to use it at all times and under all circumstances. One may not, for example, hunt down mothers-in-law. Just as dirt is matter in the wrong place, so lust is the sex instinct in the wrong place. There has been perhaps too much emphasis upon it, and it is well to recall what a great sociologist has written about a similar emphasis that was put upon it in earlier days. We are here quoting Dr. Petrim A. Sorokin, who writes, those families among us which frequently change husbands and wives, which fail in their duties to their children and adopt the moral code of the gutter, are pushing us along the road to chaos. Greece in the third and second centuries before Christ brought sex into the open. We know, he continues, because there were Kinseys in those days too, men who prided themselves on their objectivity as they calmly recorded the distressing picture of whole families getting together to indulge in promiscuous behavior. Adultery, prostitution, were so common that those who indulged were regarded merely as interesting fellows. Now note how this sociologist concludes. But such a society was not able to summon the backbone to resist in the face of war or to endure the austerity program that might have salvaged that overblown economy. Soon the glory that was Greece was over and the mighty Acropolis was only a hillside strewn with ruined marble. would be well for any country which stresses the flesh too much to remember that lesson of history. Let us take now an entirely different point of view. There's a certain amount of sympathy to be extended to those who protest against the way purity and chastity have been stressed. Too often it is negative. Almost all talks on chastity begin with don't do this or don't do that. It would seem as if it were almost a, a negative virtue rather than a positive one. No, Christianity bids us look at things in a godlike way. And what do we learn by studying man? Well, we see that every human being has two instincts. Basic, fundamental, strong. One is hunger. The other is sex. God implanted both of these. It is thanks to hunger that we preserve individual life. It is thanks to sex that we preserve social life. And God had to associate great pleasures with these two instincts in order to assure the continuation of both personal life and the human race. Naturally, there will come deviations, excesses, with either of these instincts. Man may eat too much, he may drink too much. His body will get fat. So too, there can be excesses of the sex instinct. They can be deordinate. And just as one may produce bad health from abusing the hunger instinct, so too, one can develop a carnalized mind. One would not generally put garbage into the stomach, but too often one will put garbage into the mind. Now looking at it positively, 
You, sir, not to think, therefore, that this urge they have is wrong. It's godlike. It's heaven sent. It's good. It is never wasted, even when it is controlled. Because the energy that might go out physically is sublimated and may come out in another way, mentally and spiritually, as it most often does. Now let us try to treat this subject in a dignified and positive fashion. We begin by asking, what is purity? Or what is chastity? Purity is reverence paid to the mystery of sex. I repeat. Purity is reverence paid to the mystery of sex. We do speak of the mystery of sex, and it is a mystery. But why is it a mystery? Why is it called that? If we use the Greek word, we would use the word sacrament. Now you remember that in the supernatural order every sacrament has two elements, one material, one spiritual, one that can be seen or heard or touched, and the other, which is divine. So too in the natural order sex is a mystery because it has these two characteristics. First, sex is something that is known to everyone. One is either male or female. And yet, there's something hidden from everyone. The known element is, as we said, that everyone is either male or female. The invisible, mysterious element of sex is its creativeness. A sharing in some way of the creative power of God. Now, it was God's love that made him a creator. And so God has poured that love into man and woman to make them co-creators with him. And that co-creation with him is a free gift. Now, we have certain movements in our body that are not subject to freedom. For example, breathing, breathing, digestion, circulation, and so forth are to a great extent unconscious and involuntary. They go on independently of our will. But to create a poem, a statue, or a child is a free act. God gave the divine commission, increase and multiply. Communicate new life. So we are sent into this world, therefore, to pass on a torch, a torch of life. And God has put that into our hands to burn controlled unto the purpose and destiny fixed by him. Purity, therefore, is reverence paid to the mystery of sex, and the mystery of sex is creativeness. Now a second point. All creativeness is surrounded with awe. And there is a creativeness given to man and woman. That is one of the reasons why at all times there has been an association of religion with the unity of man and woman. Not only in Christianity, and among all pagan peoples. It was felt naturally that this great power of creativeness should be surrounded in some way by religious sanction. If then we understand the mystery aright, just as in, in supernatural sacraments we mortals supply act and bread and water Words, so to hear, man and woman supply the flesh, and God supplies the mystery. 
And this awesomeness that surrounds sex is the reason why young men act in a certain way toward young women and why young women act in a certain way toward young men. There's a sense of mystery, reverence, awe, that makes each one of them shrink from a too precocious surrender of the secret. That is one of the reasons why man is naturally chivalrous toward a woman. Not because he believes that she is physically weaker, but because of the awe that he feels in the presence of mystery. Now that too is why woman is tender, sensitive, even timid, because she has a great mystery inside of her. Why cannot sex be used outside of marriage? Well, because certain powers are to be used only in certain relationships. What is lawful in one relationship is not lawful in another. A man may kill another soldier in a just war, but not in his private capacity as a citizen. A policeman can arrest someone as a duly appointed guardian of the law, fortified with a warrant, but not outside of that relationship. And so, too, the creativeness of man and woman is lawful under a relationship sanctioned by God, but not apart from that mysterious relationship called marriage. And purity will never separate the two. Purity would no more think of isolating the capacity to share in God's creativeness than oh, a good person would ever think of using a knife apart from its purpose to stab a neighbor. The things which God has joined together will not be separated. Purity, then, is not just physical intactness. In the woman, it is a firm resolve never to use the power until God shall send her a husband. And in the man, it is a steadfast desire to wait upon God's will that he have a wife, that he may use her for God's purposes. Purity, then, you see, does not begin in the body. It begins in the will. And from there it flows outward, cleansing the imagination and the will, and finally the body. Bodily purity is a repercussion or echo of the will. Life is impure only when the will is impure. You see, then, that purity is the sacristan of love. It's its guardian. And just as we do not want to see an American flag under someone's feet, because there's a mystery to that flag, it symbolizes something else. So the pure are shocked at the impure because it is the prostitution of the sacred. It makes the reverent irreverent. The essence of all obscenity is the turning of the inner mystery into a jest. Given a hidden presence of God in every person, just as there is a hidden divine presence in the bread of the altar, each person become, becomes a kind of a consecrated host. Not in the same sense as the bread of the altar, but because chastity or purity is a consecrated affection. Notice here we are making it positive, not negative. It is not something you must not do. It is something you must do, namely, dedicate an affection. For example, a mother will say to her young, never do anything of which your mother would be ashamed. So one is dedicated to the love of the mother. Young man goes with a young woman, he's dedicated to her ideals. Marriage, dedication to a wife. In each and every instance, it's always love that inspires charity and chastity and purity. 
We might give an example of this in the analogy of a musician. And we want this to describe in some way the danger of isolating sex from love and from its purpose and from its creativeness. Suppose a director of an orchestra becomes very conscious of his hands, how he is going to hold the baton, between which fingers, whether his elbow is too high, whether his right hand should be lifted above his shoulder. Suppose he concentrates just on his hand. Do you not think it's going to have an effect upon the music? Now suppose he concentrates on the music and the orchestra and the production of harmony. Well, then everything fits into place. He's very unconscious of the hand. And so too when sex becomes a part of love life and the purpose of life, then it is a dedication and it fits into the whole. So sex is not something that is isolated from life. Of course, there is self-control, there's subordination of a part to a whole, but all this, again, I repeat, is on account of serving a higher enthusiasm. When you dance, you do not concentrate on your feet, And if you did, you'd be walking on your neighbor's toes. But when you make your feet serve the spiritual and the mental and the social part of you, you have no trouble. Thus purity properly understood is the taking of love and making every part of the sex instinct fit into it. That is why frequent Holy Communion is the best guardian of chastity, because it places sex in the context of love. We've already said that chastity is the vestibule, the sacristan of love. Now, when we become in love with our Lord, when we have a sense of this tremendous ecstasy, and that's what it is, that comes from Holy Communion and from oneness with our Lord and Savior, then every part of us, our hunger instinct, our sex instinct, become a part of that love it is love that awakens chastity. It is not the other way around. In every moment of our life, from the time that we are children, just reaching the age of reason, on up until old age, it is the love of God that makes every other kind of love understandable even the love of husband and wife. He who loves honesty never has to be told not to steal. He who loves his neighbor never has to be told not to cut his throat. And so, any of us who love God, human persons, and the mystery of creativeness, we never have to be told not to do something. We're in love with the mystery. As Francis, Francis Thompson put it, But thou who knowest the hidden thing, thou hast instructed me to sing, teach love the way to be a new virginity. Do thou with thy protecting hand Shelter the flame thy breath is fanned. Let my heart's reddened glow be but as sun-flushed snow. 
And if they say that snow is cold, O oh, chastity must they be told. The hand that's chaffed with snow takes a redoubled glow. That extreme cold like heat doth sear. O oh, to the heart of love draw near, and feel how scorching rise its white cold purity. Sex is the reverence paid to the mystery of creativeness. God love.